Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spybrary podcast is for you. Since 2017, host Shane Whaley and Spybrary field agents around the world dispatch reviews and interviews with authors, historians, and fellow spy fans. We discuss everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Paul Vidic, Graham Greene, Mick Heron, Charles Cumming, Ben McIntyre, and many more. Spybrary is available on all good podcast apps and at spybrary.com. It's a brush pass, quick and simple. You are listening to Brush Pass on Spybrary. Quick reviews sent in by spy fans for spy fans. My name is Erich Wagner. I'm one of Spybrary's field agents currently stationed in East Kent. My brush past review day is the book The Spy Who Changed History. Now, I know Spybury has lots of fiction on its bookshelves, but this book is actually a carefully researched and referenced academic history book, so clearly non-fiction. But I hope it passes Shane's vetting procedures and makes it onto the podcast. The Spy Who Changed History is written by Svetlana Lokova. She's a, a Russian historian of Soviet intelligence history, currently based in England. She was lucky enough to get access to NKVD and KGB archives during a brief window of openness between Gorbachev and Putin. A lot of the material she had access to then is now firmly out of sight. I think Svetlana Lokova is now engaged in translating the smuggled Mitrokin archive into English. The eponymous spy of the title is Stanislav Shumovsky. Born in Tsarist times, he was a teenager in the revolution, so literally grew up with the, with the growing Soviet Union. And the story of his early life in those turbulent times is great reading. His passionate interest was aviation, and he progressed fast. By the late 1920s, Stalin was well aware that the Soviet Union was an industrial and technological backwater and decades, if not a whole century, behind the countries of Western Europe and the USA. He directed all-out efforts at rapid industrialization and the advancement of science. He was also quick to appreciate that in the next war that may come, the airplane would play a crucial role. Of course, the quickest way of acquiring knowledge is to copy it from someone else who's already done all the hard work figuring things out. So, so began a potent espionage operation, sending bright young students to prestigious U.S. universities. The naive and open-hearted Americans were delighted to take in these good-looking boys and girls from a poor, backward country eager for their help, and the Americans were avid to hear of the brave new society that was taking form in the, new, in the newly emergent Soviet Union. Shumovsky was in the first wave of these students, and once established, quickly became contact for more and more later arrivals. Of course, the Soviet students at MIT and the Ivy League universities all had a second secret mission. Shumovsky did more than sit at the centre of his web of agents. He was charismatic and knew his subject of aeronautics well. He got industrial placements, factory tours, and took the visiting Soviet aircraft designer Tupola on a coast-to-coast tour of the USA, going from aircraft factory to aircraft factory. As poster boy for Soviet-American good relations, he parted with Hollywood stars and even met President Roosevelt. The juxtaposition of the privations and hardships of food famine and purges back in the USSR with the relative luxury and the privileged Western lifestyle of his agents is not lost either. The volume of information transferred was huge, cabin trunks and suitcases full, not just in aircraft design, but also cars, tanks, chemicals, electronics, pharmaceuticals, all aspects of mass production and the latest assembly line manufacturing technologies. Sometimes this technology transfer could be openly taken from trade journals, patents, university research papers, 
even in company licensing agreements. Other times, confidential or secret material could be gotten from carefully infiltrated agents, sometimes even unwitting Americans who inveigled into helping, unaware of the final destination of their information. Once America was at war, security of course tightened considerably, and some of Shimoski's agents were discovered, but he himself never was, and even managed to stay on for a while passing on atom bomb secrets. This book paints a fascinating picture of how thoroughly infiltrated and compromised many American universities and manufacturing companies were by Soviet intelligence in the late 1930s. It's this book's contention that it was largely thanks to Shimovsky's work that by 1941 the Soviet Union was strong enough industrially to mass-produce the guns, tanks and planes that would win it the war with Germany. Although this book was published in 2018, I only discovered it a few months ago in my local public library, and I was so engrossed that I kept it so long there was a small overdue fine to pay. There's also an e-book version available. So, to wrap up, in conclusion, I'd recommend this book to any librarians with a shelf space, it's not a thin book, and a particular interest in pre-Cold War Soviet deep cover espionage. Can you pull off a brush pass? Send in your review to shane at spybrary.com. Thanks for listening to the Spybrary Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary.